the first speaker is uh, Charlie Gamel, who is an independent scholar working on cultural heritage projects in Afghanistan. Uh, he has also published a book on Herat, uh, titled The Pearl of Khorasan, A History of Herat, 2016, in addition to uh, several articles on uh, Iran and uh, Afghanistan. And um, his talk today uh, is about uh, Herat in the Ghadra era. I'd just like to echo everyone else's thanks to the organisers of the conference and say what a privilege it is to be here um, amongst such distinguished academics, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some very good questions later. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Herat during the 19th century and questions, as I think it said, questions of identity. To whom was Herat loyal? Was it a Qajar, was it the eastern edge of the Qajar Empire or was it the western edge of an Afghan Sadazai Empire? And what did the British really think of it? And I think I'm going to start with discussing some themes about Herat's history and why I think these themes in Herat's history are important. Um, and I think I'll just start with uh, 18, in 1863, Nassim Din Shah uh, was asked about the city of Herat by, by an Austrian traveller, Vanbury, not long lost to the Pashtun uh, ruler, Dost Mohammed Khan. And Nassim Din Shah said, I have no taste for such ruined cities. Um, and yet, when you look at Nasr al-Din Shah's writings on Herat uh, in the lead up to its fall in 1863, you get this sense that there's a sort of elegiac lament for the loss of Herat. Um, and I think Nasr al-Din Shah's comments on the fall of Herat, his interest in the day-to-day -day goings on in Herat, whether it's appointing an ulama in, in a mosque, um, or whether commenting on an Afghan delegation that came to, 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 to Tehran, shows a real keen interest in the city. And I think if you contrast, contrast that to Abdur Rahman Khan in the late 19th century, who was an Afghan ruler, Abdur Rahman Khan wasn't as interested in Herat uh, historically um, as Nasr al-Din Shah was. And I think when reading the sources that, from Abdur Rahman Khan about his, his views on Herat, it reminds me of trying to get my two-year-old to stop watching Peppa Pig. Um, there's, just, there's not really that much interest from Abdur Rahman Khan, and actually it was in his interest to outsource the defence of the west of Afghanistan to Imperial Britain. Um, so I think I'd like to just talk about some themes that, that are common throughout Herat's history and why, and why they play an important part in its identity as this, I think, uniquely misunderstood hist uh, city over the years. Culture, wit and intellectual sophistication. Herat is a Persian city of Jami, Behazad, Ansari and poets such as Hasima Anwar and the Herati school. This is, you know, we think of the Timurid Ketab Khaner, we think of the huge, we think of the Behzal Shah Nameh, we think of this great flowering of Persian poetry in, um, in the Timurid century. This really left a mark on Persian consciousness. And in 1544, Babur Mirza Homayun fled to then Safavid Herat and was treated to this extraordinary reception um, by the Safavids, which echoed Timurid courtly sophistication, Timurid rituals, and so again, there's this idea that, that the Timurid century obviously feeds into Safavid's conception of itself as, a, as the sort of Persian cultural hegemon in the, um, in, in, of the region. And, and even Herat's role in the Safavid time, you know, this, this again feeds into the way the Khajals saw it. Um, Shah Abbas, it was, the, it was the place where Shah Abbas was sort of, did his tutelage growing up. And in fact, Shah Abbas was even um, in 1581 crowned there as emperor when Shah Ismail II died. Um, by Ali Khali Khan, one of the Lala's. So, so here's this idea that, that Herat is forming this eastern edge of a Persian empire. Um, and it's interesting that, that Herat, briefly in 1581, after having been a Timurid imperial capital, became the Safavid imperial, imperial capital, though not for very long. Um, and that cultural element is important today. When Heratis talk about Pashtuns, and particularly this is obviously important, and now the Taliban are back in power, when Heratis talk about Pashtuns, they're, they're very, very disdainful of them as these sort of, um, they call them donkeys and they, they, they don't know, you know, Persian poetry and they're not very sophisticated. And so this, this feeds into Herat's identity as a Persian city of, of sophistication and wit. I think the next thing that I think is important is fertility. 
um, the fertility of the Hari Rood oasis. And practically what does that mean? That means that Herat is a very rich uh, oasis town um, and it has often held out the promise to empires from far and wide that it can be something, it can be, it can raise money, you can land an army there, uh, and it has this sort of practical significance that relates to its fertility. And I think from Herodotus calling it the breadbasket of Asia to 19th century travelogues um, talking about the, the sweetness of Herat's water, um, and there's a great Beheshti Heravi, who's a 16th century, um, 17th century Persian poet, he sort of rhapsodizes about the, the, the pureness and the sweetness of Herat's water. And again, we talk about the practical terms when we, when we come to the 19th century. The British were very worried that the Russians would use Herat's fertility as a place to, to land an army as a staging post into going into India in the context of the Great Game. So this, this um, fecundity and fertility of Herat is very important for its self-image and how it sees itself. I remember going into different Karoch and Obey and all these districts around Herat and they would people would tell you that the, the different bits of the different varieties of grapes they've got, the different varieties of, sort of figs they've got, and, and that is really an important part of the way Herat sees itself and also the way the world sees it. Um, religion, Herat is predominantly a Sunni city um, with, a, with, with a great tradition of Sufis, Nachbandi and other Chishti and other Sufi orders throughout Herat. Um, Herat's Sufi peers had long played important political mediating roles between invading armies um, and Herati rulers going all the way back to the Mongols and before. Um, and again, one of the earliest uprisings against the Gajar rule was couched in highly sectarian terms. This was the Bukharan Sufi mystic Sufi Islam, um, who was a dyer and actually re resident in Herat, who rose up um, with pretty calamitous consequences for him um, against Gajar authority in the early 19th century. So Herat is a Persian Sunni city, and I think... Um, that is a really important thing to bear in the mind in the context of the 19th century when this sort of Persianate Sunni identity is facing off against the Persianate Shia identity with the Qajars. And that tension, I think, is important. It's important in terms of legitimation and the way these conflicts in the 19th century were, were I suppose, <coughs> presented, um, but I think we can overstate that importance. Mm. So the, the big shrine in Herat to Abdullah, Abdullah Ansari at Ghazargah was repeatedly desecrated by Qajar sources coming in during the 19th century. And again, this is, this is, an, this is an indication of, of some of the sectarian forces that were at play in this conflict. And this obviously began, began when, when Herat became, in, in from 1510 onwards, when Herat became a Safavid city. That was when the imprimatur of, of, of a Shia identity and, and the settling of Shia um, Pezilvash, um troops and administrators in Herat, that was when that begun. Um, and I think this begins the tension with, between Herat as a Persian city of this cultural heritage, um, which the Safavids consciously aped. Um, and I do think that, that Shah Abbas's time, or Abbas Mirza's time in Herat, when he was a Lala, the, what he would have seen of the Timurid architecture, what he would have seen of um, all, all the sort of t Timurid um, buildings that were there, that, I think, informed the way um, Safavid Isfahan developed. Um, and, and interestingly, in the 19th century, there was a Dost Muhammad Khan, in, in, in sort of reflecting this, this sectarian element, he had a cannon forged called the Cha, um, the cha Yari, um, relating to the four caliphs, and then in Herat they, they had one slightly bigger, which was called the Panj Tani, um, in commemoration of five uh, leading, um, obviously, figures in Shia Islam. I think another thing which is really important is geography. Um, Herat's centre of the Timurid Empire, although paradigmatic in terms of the way Herat sees itself, I think this was an exception to the norm whereby power converged on Herat and didn't radiate from within its walls out into the surrounding territories. Um, the upheavals of the early Ilkhanid years and these messy post-Timurid centuries that, before we get into the 19th century, prove that Herat sits at the edge of different geographies, the eastern outpost of a Persian Empire and the western edge of an Afghan or even an Uzbek poly polity. And in 1588, when Herat fell to the Uzbeks, a contributing factor to the fall was the Safavid inability to send reinforcements from Mashhad to Herat. And again, before, in the lead up to 1838, to the first siege of Herat, it was incumbent on the Qajars to send out sort of intelligence gathering scouts into what was Eastern Khorasan for them, because they didn't quite understand what was going on there. And again, this, is, this, this, I, this picks up on this tension that 
the Kojars felt that this was theirs by dint of the Safavid legacy that they were trying to ape, but it was also practically a little bit far away from their ability to control it. And this is the theme actually throughout history, I think throughout Herat's history, where you have imperial capitals misunderstanding Herat, imperial capitals unable, they're both attracted by the fertility, the fecundity, the, the intellectual excellence of Herat, but they're also, it's very difficult to control. So you have these, like you had under the, uh, in the Ilkhanids after the Mongols, the, the Khartid, the first sort of Herati dynasty post Genghis Khan. This was a sort of a client state that which, which, the, which the Ilkhanids always struggled to control fully. And the deaths of Danishman Bahadur and Amir Chupan in Herat are indicative of Herat, the difficulty that people had in controlling Herat. People wanted it, but because it was far from the sort of traditional imperial capitals of the region, it was quite difficult to hold. And this is an important theme in the, in the 19th century, when Herat, if anything, is this sort of Sadazai, Pashtun enclave that's trying to play off different sides against each other. Empires have lacked for knowledge of what's going on in Herat, and even up to the late 20th century in 1979, when Herat rose up against the Afghan communist rule in the Qiyam of Istasharahut, Politburo transcripts of conversations between Kabul and Moscow indicate quite clearly that neither side actually knew what was going on in Herat. Kabul thought that Herat was, in, was absolutely totally in the pay of Iran, which, which wasn't the case. The Qiyam of Istasharahut was, was, was a local uprising driven by Afghan issues. Um, and Moscow bizarrely thought that Herat was in the pay of China, which is obviously wrong as well. Um, and, and I think this is a feature, this misunderstanding is also a feature of the 19th century, where you have voluminous accounts from British imperial strategists talking about Herat as the gate to India. This assumption that as soon as Herat fell, this Russian army would march straight through in, in, into British India and take British in, India, seemingly unaware of how difficult it was for British imperial armies to have an army in Afghanistan and beat the Afghans and then, and then secure it for themselves. And I think um, reading this, it's, I mean, and having been a diplomat and done sort of some sort of geopolit geopolitical strategizing of myself, it's amazing how damaging groupthink is. So what? I think in Herat you have a streak of independence that's driven by fertility of the Harirud oasis, the cultural excellence of its, its sort of courtly traditions, the strength of its fort, um, and its geographical position at sometimes the edge of these competing empires. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now, and th th those are the themes that I think that, that are important and that drive some of the 19th century and, and what's going on, what's what we're going to be talking about with the Qajars. Um, so after the regicide of Nadir Shah Afshar, Ahmed Khan was given a, a coronation as Ahmed Shah Durrani in Kandahar with a sheaf of barley, which still did form part of the Afghan flag. Um, and the Pashtun chiefs, when they came in, stated, a, stated their intention to seek their own nation and independence from Shia Persian sovereignty. So already in the late 18th century, you have this stated Pashtun intention to seek independence from Shia Persian sovereignty. And um, early, early Pashtuns who had settled in Herat, that is what caused the, the Sadazais, that is what caused um, Ahmad Shah Durrani's gaze to, to flip that way. This isn't. This wasn't a natural. This wasn't like. This wasn't a natural um, sort of hunting ground, I suppose, or, or geography for Pashtuns. Um, but but the the Sadazai um, Pashtuns who settled in Herat around the same time that Shah Abbas was in is was in Isfahan. This who were sort of mercenaries and horse traders. Those are the people to whom um, Ahmad Shah Durrani is looking to expand to the east. Um, and the, the, as I said, the Pashtuns' nat natural inclination was to look east. But I think the, the Sadazai lineage, lineage that Ahmed Shah shared meant for him that Herat would always mark the western edge of a Sadazai um, empire. Um, and then his capture of Herat in 1750 sort of set the scene on this and began Herat's, I suppose, official, the official presence in Herat of, of, of Sadazai as, as ruling, ruling elite. And, and Ahmed uh, Siraj al Tawarikh says, Ahmed Shah, bearing in mind that whoever became ruler of Iran, would find Khorasan a barrier between Afghanistan and Iran, undertook to guarantee the independence of Khorasan. So in the Pashtu mind, Herat becomes a buffer. Herat isn't this inalienable cultural stronghold that, for, that it is for the Persians. It's a buffer to the Iranian state coming east into Kandahar. And I think throughout, having said that, in the early exchanges between Herat's Sadazai rulers and the Qajars, 
the Sadazai rulers thought very clearly, you know, we've, we've taken Herat by dint of arms and we've taken Herat by sort of through our military prowess. And they, they looked down on the Qajar's uh, sort of revanchist Safavid project. Um, and yet, despite this, they were happy that a feature of the Sadazai relationship with the, with the Qajars was that they were happy to pay lip service to Qajar sovereignty through Khutbah and Sikha if this meant that they could get protection from the Sadaza, from the Qajars. And why did they want this? They wanted this because the Durrani Empire, o over the course of its time, was prone to splitting, and it was prone to intrafamilial sp splits that separated Herat from Kandahar and Kabul. Um, Qajar Herat, in the con conquest of, of 1796 of Mashhad by Aga Muhammad, Hamid, Aga Muhammad Khan, held the revival of Qajar dominance into eastern Khorasan. And early diplomatic exchanges between the Qajar and the Sadazai representatives suggest that Safavid rule by proxy over Herat might be a possibility. Uh, and in, in 1800, a Herati diplomat headed to the Qajar court to discuss this age-old issue of Herat's allegiance. And again, the, the, the Sadazai claims that basically rested on their sort of force majeure. We own, we own Herat, and we, um, and we think that it should, uh, that's how it should stay. Um, and the Qajar counterclaims again reach back into the Safavid past to imagine, to establish this imagined sovereignty over Herat. And in the lead up, uh, to, yeah, as I said, in the lead up to this imagined sovereignty, in the lead up to the 1837 siege, the Qajars were forced to send English missions into Khorasan to find out exactly what's going on. But the Qajar, the Qajar claims over Herat weren't totally, weren't just fictitious, they were also a desire, and you see this throughout Qajar Firman's a desire to protect Shia co-religionists in Khorasan from Turkmen slavers, um, and, and, and a slightly paternalistic view of the security of Herat. And that, and that was obviously based on their desire to control a very fertile and profitable province, but it was also based on a, on, on a, on a heartfelt desire to, to protect that region from the, um, the, the, the slave trade. And you have lots of um, commentators, commentators who go to, or lots of visitors who go to Herat in the 19th century comment on the slave trade, of which the Sadazai Pashtuns were, were an enthusiastic um, player. So um, I think it's Pottinger, when, when he's in Herat in, in 1838, says, it was hardly safe for a stranger to be abroad after sunset, unless protected by an armed escort, there was too great a likelihood of being seized and sold into slavery. Um, and I think, but, and British Herat, and then we come to why British, why Britain thought that, that, that Herat had to be kept according to, to, to its designs. Um, obviously, the Great Game is something I'm not going to go into in, a big, in great detail here, but Britain felt that Herat was the key to India. And if Herat fell, Russian armies, as I've said, would, would um, march all the way to British India. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it is important to state that, that, that the Great Game didn't just start as a fear of Russia, it started actually as a fear of French, ad French advances in the region. So, and actually, the, the, the role of French advisors to Qajar courts in the siege of 1838 and beyond. That is, that is an important role that French engineers and French military strategists played alongside um, Russians as well. Um, and, and again, throughout the 19th century, Britain, you're right, right up until the early 20th century, Britain is still obsessing over Herat's loyalty, obsessing over um, Herat's which way it's going to turn, seemingly unaware of, of the events that had taken place in the 19th century, which showed Afghanistan a very difficult country to, to, to bend to your will. And in 1830, the, the fear, the British fear of Russian advances into India um, via Herat had gained new momentum, helped along by Russian-Persian alliances and the concomitant Russian Russophobia in India. Russian military successes in the, in the Caucasus um, and the humiliating treaty, obviously, of Turkmen Chai, which effectively um, rendered Persia, as, as someone said, de delivered bound hand and foot to the court of St. Petersburg, forced the Qajars to look to Khorasan with the encouragement of Russia and to Herat in pursuit of their Safavid legacy, now that the Caucasus was in Russian hands. Um, um, and then you have, obviously, a, a, alongside you have Sir John Malcolm, uh, ringing the alarm bells about, about the Russian um, attacks on Herat, uh, Russian designs on Herat and Qajar designs on, on Herat. Um, and by the 1832, the Qajars had launched a series of attacks on Khorasan, ostensibly to curb the trade of slaves, as I've said. Um, and, but 
but I think also you had this against the backdrop of that, even though you had tensions between Yara Mohammed Khan, who was the vizier of Prince Cameron, and was like vizier in Herat, uh, and the Qajars in Tehran. The Qajars felt that Herat was not doing enough to curb the slave trade, um, and, and obviously Yara Mohammed Khan um, felt that this was a lucrative business. Um, and there's a, there's a nice description from Siraj um, Tabarikh about um, a Qajar minister explaining to Yara Mohammed Khan the region's history and the power dynamics um, in a slightly condescending terms. In the olden days, Afghanistan was part of Iran, but following the assassination of Nader Shah, Ahmad Shah Sadazai established an independent regime there. Up to now, Herat has been in Sadazai hands, presently Prince Kamran's, but the rest of the kingdom is under control of the son of Sardar Payanda Khan. The prince, therefore, ought to vacate Herat and come to the Shah of Iran. Or he should have the khutbah read and the coinage minted in the name of the Shah of Iran, and should collect and send the revenues agreed on by treaty, and also send his son um, as bond. He would thereby attain peace of mind, otherwise we will take Herat by force. And that's a really nice summation of, 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 of what the Qajars thought, and it's actually quite a, a nice indication of the flexibility of the Qajar approach, which was um, fealty, revenues, or, or khutbah, or you can have this sort of the, the veneer of fealty through khutbah and sikkah. Um, And the British obviously um, are, are getting increasingly terrified at this, so they send, as they do, they send Mahan Lal, um, who, was a, who was a British India office um, officer, into Herat to try and shore up relations with Kamran. Um, and, and obviously they sought, Lal's team sought assurances from Kamran Shah that Herat would, would remain neutral in the face of Persian uh, pressure. And interestingly, on this, on this trip, Mahan Lal, this is sort of the start of, of Britain's real obsession with, with Herat. Um, Lal sent out to, to inspect the city's def defences and concluded pretty uh, negatively about the quality of Herat's defences and about the quality of the city itself, which again is, is ironic given, given the basis on which the British base there sensed that Herat was the key to India on the strength of the citadel, the fertility of the basis. So even there you have a, you have a sort of a, a nascent contradiction in the way, the way British was thinking and the way it was reporting it. Um, and, and so, so Lao was, Lao was trying to get from Kanan Shah assurances of his independence. Um, and, I mean, obviously, the, the, the uh, accounts that Mahan Lao um, writes about his audience with, with Kanan Shah are amusing, and I think it points to the, to the sort of, I suppose, relative decrepitude of Herat's court relative to, to, to the heights of the Timurid and, and Safavid times. And there's one very bizarre uh, detail where um, during one of the audiences with Kamran Shah, Kamran puts a, a goldfish bowl with three goldfish between the two of them as they're talking, and I have no idea why he would have done that. Um, and I think Kamran, during these meetings with Mahan Nas, professed that he was totally loyal to his friendship to the British, that he was neither a friend to the Persians nor a, nor a friend to the Russians. Um, and I think this is a subtle contradiction of Kamran's long-standing ties to the Qajar court, which he manifested in Khutta and, and so Sikha and Khutba. Um, and I think it's, it's easy to present Kamran Shah's actions or his words as perfidious. And again, this word perfidious was a word that the, the Ilkhan had used about the Karps the whole time. They look one way, they look the other, and they tell you one thing and they do another thing. Um, and I think we have to understand that, that this, this sort of streak of independence, this streak of opportunism within Herat is born of geography. It's born of the threats that they thought that they had from the Qajars and the threats that they had from the, their sort of Pashtun cousins, I suppose, in Kandahar and Kabul. So this is, this is Herat playing its role as a city, as a, as a, as a province that's, that's menaced on a few sides by different competing powers and has to tread a very fine line between uh, meeting these two, these, these pressures. Um, and I think Mohan Lal even, even, he noted this, he said, being afraid of the Persian government, he, Kamran, is very anxious to make an alliance with the English power and is extremely afraid of his ministers, the family of Yar Muhammad. So even his own ministers he's, he has some fear of and never dares to feed his horse without their sanction. So by offering the out, outward sim symbols of loyalty to Tehran, um, Kamran could largely avoid military conflict with Persia, but then he could also profess loyalty to, to Britain. So this is, this is, again, these are the sort of contradictions and confusions that have had political strategists over the years um, scratching their heads. 
Um, and again, you know, the 20, 21st century of observers of Herat, I mean, I remember working in Afghanistan at the time, and you would speak to people in Kabul who would say, well, you know, the, the Heratis, they're very close to, they're very close to the, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and, and then you'd, you'd speak to the Iranians and say, well, actually, the, the, the Heratis are far too close to Kabul. And you'd speak to the Heratis and say, well, we're actually Afghan, and, and we're very proud of the fact that we're part of an Afghan nation. So I think this is, this is a theme that runs through um, Herat's history. Um, and then I think the, the, the siege itself is obviously, um, much like a lot of these sieges, um, it, it dragged on and it was very gruesome and very grim. And there's a, there's a nice uh, line from um, Riyazi Hedavi, who's a, a, a Shia Afghan chronicler, who says, Oh gardener, when you expel the birds from the garden, spare the nests of the nightingales which long made their home within. Um, and that was a that was a sort of a plea to the Qajars not, not not to destroy as much as they did as they did, um, and 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 obviously the the the, the siege as we all know the, the the siege of Herat was was lifted by British naval pressures uh, on, on the south of Iran. But I think the the conversations that were had during 1838 1837 was it was a year of lots of fighting and in 1838 there's diplomatic exchanges going back and forth. Um, the Qajar demands, demands remain the same. Herat and Yar Muhammad Khan desist from plundering trade. Their pilgrim routes into Persian Khorasan. Um, obviously, the remaining Persian and Shia prisoners within the citadel weren't executed. And Qamran's status changed from Shah or Prince to Mirza. Um, Qamran himself does demand to be on equal footing with the Qajars of Badr and that Herat remain politically independent. Um, that the Qajars desist from sending troops to Herat and that um, the Qajars desist from the notion of installing a Qajar garrison within the walls of Herat. Um, and I think that that's... An, I, I, how long have I got for this? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, uh, that's, that, 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 was the, that was the tenor of, of the negotiations that, that, that were going back and forth about um, how each side saw Herat. Um, and, the, and then you had the sort of negotiation between the Qajars and the British, um, and then there's a, there's a very pithy uh, letter from McNeil to the Qajar court saying, it is stated that in histories and maps, Herat is described and laid down as belonging to the territory of Persia. The statement is correct, but Georgia, Shuki, Evran, Karabakh, and even Mosul and Baghdad have also been numbered amongst the hereditary dominions of Persia. But these places are now in the possession of others and no longer belong to the Persian government. And when you, know, when you read some of the, the heartfelt Qajar um, uh, accounts of the time, you can see that that, that must have stung, um, and that must have hit on a sore point in the Qajar psyche. Um, when we fast forward to 1857 and the Treaty of Persia, by which the Qajars formally were pressured into, very similar to 1838, with pressure, with naval pressure, the Qajars were pressured into renouncing their sovereignty of Herat. Interestingly, after 1857, where the Qajars agreed not to interfere with the affairs of Herat, up until 1863, when Dost Mohammed Khan took Herat for, for the sort of Pashtun um, Afghanistan, Khutbah uh, and Sikha was still being said in the name of the Qajars in Iran up until 1863. And again, I think this is a really interesting point that even though 1860, uh, 1857 marked this sort of official end of Qajar Herat's role, or, or to Qajar, Qajar role in Herat, the reality of this st still persisted. So the, the Sadazais in Herat were happy to, um, to receive the sort of protection from the Qajars because they felt menaced by um, their, what was going on to the east of them in Kandahar and Kabul. Um, and concluding thoughts, I think, what was Herat for the British? I don't think that Herat for the British was the gateway to India. I think events prove very conclusively that, that holding Herat was very difficult marching an army through Kandahar, Kabul, and then on into, into British India was almost impossible, as the British tried two times. Um, and no matter how fertile the Harirud oasis, Herat wasn't the key to India. Um, and, and I think that there are even some sort of early, there are some nice early 20th century uh, accounts from British diplomats where they sort of slowly come into the realization that this is the case. And there's a great, uh, uh, sort of an open letter from a Persian diplomat to Henry Rawlinson in 1880, where they lay out very conclusively why Britain, the folly of Britain's, Britain's policy, sort of saying, why do you think that Herat in the hands of the Pashtuns will be any safer than Herat in the hands of the Persians? 
um, and, and answering the, asking these questions that actually are logically quite difficult to understand. What was Herat for the Afghans? Herat's place in Afghanistan is a very complicated one. Um, Dost Mohammed Khan died in Herat in 1863. He's buried in Herat. During the Afghan-Soviet War, the Herat experienced the most number of casualties. I think it was the second, large, the second largest number of casualties per year. It played a hugely important role in, in fighting the Soviets. And yet, after the Afghan Boundary Commission um, in 1888 sort of drew the lines, as Charles was talking about, drew the lines that sort of sealed Herat off from Afghanistan, sorry, from Iran, it falls away from view. And it ceases to be an important part in, in the minds of many Afga Afghan historians of Afghanistan's history. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that, that I think that's a really, and obviously I talk about it in my book and I'm doing more work on it now, um, that is a really important, how did Herat, a city which has played such an important part in Afghanistan, how did it fall away so conclusively? My sense is that the Afghan nation that, 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 that came into being after 1863 was a predominantly and a self-consciously Pashtun one, um, one in which it was difficult for a city like Herat with its Timurid legacy um, and its legacy of culture um, and, and sort of very um, self-consciously Persianate culture, it was a difficult place for Herat to fit into the Afghan notion of a nation. Also, geography. Herat is far from Kabul um, and it felt very cut off. If you read 1930s accounts of Herat uh, in the context of Afghanistan, you get the sense of a city apart, a city stuck on the edge of the sort of western edge of an Afghan nation. I think if anyone had a claim over Herat, it was this Persia, it was Persia, it was the city of Behazad, Jami, as I've said. This, it feeds directly into Persia's self-image, the image of the Qajars, the image of the Safavids, given the importance that the, the sort of Timurid identity plays in culturally in Iran. Um, and, and, and yet you have these ideas of geography, um, which made it very difficult for Herat to be anything other than a, than a fiction um, of, of, of Qajar Persia. The next speaker is Sabri Atesh, who is an associate professor at Southern Methodist University um, in Dallas, uh, Texas. He uh, has written, his first book was on the Young Turk uh, Tunale Hilmi Bey. And uh, to those of us who study Iran, uh, he is well known as the author of one of the uh, best books on Iranian-Ottoman uh, relations that I know of, Iranian, uh, Ottoman-Iranian Borderlands Making a Boundary, Cambridge 2030. Uh, where is he? Oh, you already left. Okay, come on here. It's my luck to be the last speaker. I uh, first of all want to thank uh, the uh, conveners, and I think I should thank, uh, thank Professor Melville for giving me the task of giving a uh, talk about the transformation of Ottoman Iranian borderlands. So it's only 400 years, and uh, I'm hoping um, to summarize it um, in four to five minutes. To follow on what uh, Dr. Abdul was saying. So the question of um, frontiers has been central to Ottoman history. Uh, for almost 100 years, the discussions about the frontier uh, will come and go, but they were central to uh, the Ottoman historiography. But this was the Western frontiers. The Eastern frontiers, frontiers with Iran, did not receive as much attention until very recently. Now we have a good literature actually forming about this frontier. But uh, it is no exaggeration to suggest that the boundary that divides modern states of Iran, Iraq, and Turkey played an equally consequential role in shaping the nature of the Ottoman and, of course, Safavid and successor states and their imperial ideologies. This boundary, one of the longest in the making, and perhaps oldest among Muslim countries, underwent four centuries evolution to reach its final form. If we start the history of this boundary with Chaldiran in uh, uh, 1514, 
exactly 400 years later, a couple, year, couple days after the First World War started, the last commission actually ended on the spot. So, um, in the words of Owen Lattimore, uh, this frontier functioned as an ancient interacting frontier, and it was not a sudden one. Its final shape is a product of the long history of the Ottoman-Iranian confrontations and negotiations, the agency and resilience of various borderland peoples and their struggles to preserve their habitats, and lastly, the great power intervention. It is also a product of the larger process of territorialization of sovereignty and the transition from suzerain to sovereign relations, marked by the transformation of peripheral governance from indirect to direct role. Now, as Bernard Brodel says, when looking at the Mediterranean uh, boundaries, frontiers, he says we should imagine hundreds of different types of frontiers. So instead of going over hundreds of frontiers between Iran and the Ottoman Empire, I will limit myself to three of them. First, religio-ideological, then geopolitical, and the medical frontier. I would approach this from the perspective of an Ottoman historian. I feel uh, it, uh, good to uh, say this in front of so many uh, Iranian scholars. It makes my life easier. But I will have, of course, inherent biases associated with this viewpoint. So my paper will be mostly based on Ottoman chronicles and Ottoman understanding of this, uh, this border. Now, the two types of frontier, the religio-ideological and geopolitical, actually evolved in relation to one another. But it also changed in regard to developments elsewhere, especially in Europe. However, the developments surrounding the third one, that is the medical, accelerated transformation of this borderland into a more defined boundary. So, that, therefore, I will conclude my discussion with... Uh, the regulation of a specific cross-border movement, namely the transport of dead Shia bodies for burial in Ottoman Iraq, and the outbreak of cholera, how they became instrumental actually in finalizing this border. So by highlighting this rather peculiar border crossing, I aim to show how it helped regularize the crossing of the living, living bodies across the frontiers. Now, the struggles for this border region, for hegemony over Mesopotamian uh, plains and the Zagros Mountains, goes back to the ancient history. But in the 16th century, it became the scene of wars between the uh, Safavid and Ottomans. Now, one of the questions I ask, as we are in the idea of Iran seminar, what Iran meant for the Ottomans? And the basic question I'm asking was, Iran, Dar al Harb, or was Iran Dar al-Islam? If it is Dar al-Harb, what it means? What are the repercussions? If it's Dar al-Islam, what are the repercussions? And then the other side of the question, how did Iran become actually Adams accepted it as Dar al-Shia? Right? So this, when you look at the frontier, you can actually follow this transformation. Now how it started, of course, the Ottoman Safavid encounters starts very early on. It starts with Sheikh Junaid coming to Anatolia. Adams actually sent him money, they are very suspicious of him, and he spends that money on copying the works of Ibn al-Arabi, which become a very important actually in shaping the Safavid ideas about kingship, and about Insan al-Kamil, and Shah has Insan al-Kamil. So, um, that note um, aside, so the relations go back there. And Adams will actually send monies to Erdabil, called Charag Akjasi, we can follow from in Amat registers, called, or the gift register for Adams. But when Shah Ismail comes to power, things change. And the reason things change is because it was a revolution. And it has a lot of appeal in Anatolia. So Ottomans basically faced the prospect of losing Anatolia to this revolution. Now, what happens here, Ottoman ideology about Iran starts shaping. And in almost all Ottoman chronicles, when you look, Iran is seen as a land that used to be Sunni and lost to some heretics, so we have to get this Vilayeti Iran, as they call it, which is kind of rather disparagingly, they don't call it 
you know, as a separate country, but it's this vilayet that the Shahi Gomrah, this is the uh, expression that Adam Chronicles use, right? This Gomrah actually taken under control, we have to bring it to straight path. Why? Because Sheikh Safi was a Sunni Sheikh. So this is kind of at the basic, uh, is the, how Ottoman ideas about some of Iran start shaping, right? It was ours, we had to get it back. Now, when this start, of course, with Selim the first, right? The guy who um, carried out Chaldera, he actually convinced a council of ulama and tests them to come up with a fatwa or solutions to how to wage war against Iran. Because in Islam, it is rather problematic, a Muslim state waging war on another Muslim state. So how are you going to do this, right? And in the meantime, of course, South Africa's revolutionary activity is going on in Anatolia, and you have to find a solution. So what they did is basically come up with fatwas, and the council ended, the Mufti of the time publishes the fatwa, and Ottomans will declare jihad on the South Africa. It's on the grounds of suppressing innovations and punishing the leaders of secession from fate. From 1512 onward, Ottoman religious authorities start issuing those anti-Shia and anti qizalash I think we should call them, fatwas, warning Muslims, and I quote this, warning Muslims to be aware of them, declaring them to be worse than infidels. And one of the very famous Ottoman uh, Sheikh of Islam and historian, Kemal Pasha, that, that says <clears throat> they are worse than Harbi kafirs. Harbi is like kind of the real kafirs. Right? Those are worse than them. Because they are kafir and mulhid. They're not only kafirs, but they're also mulhid, apostates. So it is permissible and even incumbent upon Muslims to kill their men, divide their goods, women and children, and any of the Guzad or Ghazis who dies in this pursuit will be declared a martyr, a shaheed. Right? So this is the conceptual kind of ideological framework that how um, the Adams saw Iran. Now this idea reached kind of its crescendo during the time of Suleiman the Magnificent. Now what is really interesting about the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, you have uh, one of the, the famous Sheikh of Islam, Abu uh, Saud, who kind of combines Adam and law with Sharia. At the same time, in Iran, in Iran you have al karakin doing kind of the opposite. So what happens, Suleiman wants to carry out campaigns, and I think they are very much informed by religious ideology. He carries out four campaigns into, towards South of Iran, none of them very successful because Sheikh uh, Shah Tammas actually turns them into hollow victories. And the last one that uh, Suleiman actually carries in 1553 against Iran is actually to force Iran, to, to force Tahmas to have peace with him rather than uh, defeat him. So, <clears throat> in the fatwas of the time of Suleiman, the um, Ottoman ulama put the Qazalbash in three categories. They are kafir, kafir or kuffar, unbelievers. They are baghi, they rebel, because Ottomans, at least ideologically, saw Iran as kind of our land that we have to return to the fold of Sunni Islam, right? So the Safars are rebels. But they're also Murtad, they're apostates, they're also Rafizi, they are rejectors, and they are Mulhid, they are deviators. Now the question is, when you categorize somebody like this, how are you going to have borders with them? Because there are two borders, right? One, you have to find have the sectarian boundary, the boundaries between even though there is no land that you can say Shiism starts here and Sunnism ends here, but you still have to find a boundary. The other is the geopolitical boundary. And the question is how those two will form each other. Now, Ottomans are not alone, of course. As this is happening in Iran, you have uh, intense uh, anti-Sunni activities during the time of Shah Tahmas. And... Um, Alamara gives some very interesting examples of Shah, the, the, during the time of Shah Tahmas, which we don't have to go into, but this is what is going on. So, 
So this exacerbation of the sectarian hostility or increasing the visible religious ideolo ideological frontier makes both states to have a boundary. And this boundary will come after those campaigns in 1553. And how it happened is one of the uh, uh, very wonderful Adam Chronicles, Bayani Menazili Seferi Irakim by Matrak Jinasu, he says, and he uses this word, he says, it became obvious that Shahmat is not possible. So another strategy was necessary. And the strategy is, after, of course, a lot, a lot of writing, uh, slanderous letters, some of them actually not as slanderous as the others, they finally signed a treaty in 1555, called the Amasya Treaty. Now, what is interesting about this, Adams were forced to accept Safa Iran as a legitimate entity. And that is a very important turning point, conceptually, also. So, um, so when you look at the communication between the parties, you see that there are two negotiations going on. One is sectarian, about the sectarian boundary, the other is about the real geopolitical boundary. And both required a clear definition. Now what happened after the treaty, Ottomans said, okay, we will accept Iran is going to Hajj, going to Atabat, and but we are also going to stop cursing the first three caliphs, because this is always, one of the, re, one of the ways I try to look at Ottoman Iranian relations is, you know, we can go all about sectarianism, about religion, about this and that. I want to look at their treaties and to see what were they discussing when they came together. What were the terms of engagement? And you see, religion always, at least symbolically, comes first, and then other things were discussed, right? So the, the treaty divided Georgia between them and granted Ottomans Iraq, or most of it, um, parts of Kurdistan, Western Armenia, and Iran received Tabriz, Yerevan, and Nakhchivan. Now with this treaty, the regimes of border crossing and rules regarding it emerged as one of the most critical components of Ottoman-Iran relations. Now this border crossing has always been, in my understanding, one of the main issues between Iran and the Ottoman Empire. Because when the Safavid agents were coming to Anatolia, Anatolian masses going to Shah Ismail, the idea of marking a border where Safavid revolution will stop emerged as the most important point for the Ottomans. So you have to have a boundary, and it finally, after 50 years of devastating wars, and you can only imagine how the borderland communities actually were suffering in those wars. Ottomans carrying out campaign, Shah Hamas coming and burning everything down, and for 50 years, it was uh, one of the most devastating periods for the people of the region, if not for the empires themselves. Now, what happens also with this Treaty of Amasya, Iran is now accepted as part of the land of Islam. Because Suleiman says, holy places were open to all Muslims now. Right? So Iran starts transforming into at least a vague Dar al-Islam rather than Dar al-Haram. And this I call it secularization. But by, by secularization I mean a relation that is not based on confessional identities but on interstate relations that are based on treaties. Not in the secular laicite, I'm not using it as laicite. Now Suleiman rem reminds the Shah the essence of treaty was about frontiers. And the word he used is hudud du memleket ve serhadi vilayet. So you see that this is the essence of the treaty. Where are our frontiers? How are we going to know where the Ottoman Empire ends, Iran starts, and vice versa? Now, what is really interesting, this is, this parallels developments elsewhere. If you look at the European history, at the exact same year, with the Treaty of Augsburg, the Catholic and Protestant for the first time recognize each other. So you look from kind of the big picture, this is not something that is going on only in between Iran and the Ottoman Empire. It is part of an intercontinental development in Eurasia, right? 
Now, there are differences between Amasya and, of course, uh, uh, the Treaty of Augsburg, but in essence, they are very, very similar. Now, of course, having a treaty doesn't mean that you will not have other wars. About 20 years after the Treaty of Amasya, Safavids Anonymous went through the most violent part of their history in my mind the wars over the Caucasus. When you read the Ottoman uh, Chronicles of time, it's really mind-boggling how they made uh, heaps of skulls that one of the Chronicles thought he was from Pasha to the cause. It causes one to lose their mind looking at those uh, towers of the skulls that they were built. So the wars over the Caucasus are, are really, really ferocious. Now what happened after the wars of Caucasus, they made treaties. The first one is Treaty of Amasya, sorry, not Amasya, Istanbul. And the uh, agreement refers to what is called Suleyman Senur. Uh, and for the first time, in 1590, they, it made provisions for appointment of diplomats who in certain parts of the boundary will go and talk to people and ask them where the boundary is. So we are seeing closely, right, leaving the religio-ideological border behind and slow formation of a geopolitical boundary between those two powers. And the terms they use are called kat hudud be men is sudud. Kat hudud is defining the boundary, men is sudud is preventing intervention in each other's um, affairs. Now, of course, they had two other treaties after that, I will not go over them, and, uh, and war. But when Shah Abbas, of course, uh, took the reign, he took advantage of Ottomans going through some internal revolts, and then he pushed the pendulum, that is the borders, westward. So all other treaties that were done, three of them, right, they were thrown out of the window. So we have uh, a new, new uh, border. Let me see if I can show you kind of a kind of the time of those treaties. So Shah Abbas's wars, of course, uh, again, devastated the borderland communities. And uh, the parties came together. Again, the debate was cut a sinner, betayini sovor. This process culminated in a, what Ottoman historic uh, chronicles called Nasu Pasha Treaty of 1618. And then, um, as you can see, there will be another treaty, uh, Treaty of Serab in 1618. Now, what happens, of course, these treaties did not end the fluidity of the borders. When a less resourceful ruler replaced Abbas, it was the Ottoman's turn to push the pendulum eastward this time. And immediately, the Ottoman chronicles start referring the Ottoman Sultan as Caliph of the world, and Iranians are now Mulhid, Rafidi, Qizilbash, Khanzir, and most importantly, of course, Mushrikun, whose killing was justified by Quranic injunctions. Now, despite such discursive bragging, Ottomans failed to expand their frontiers in the north, but were able to capture Baghdad, and this came at the heel of 16 years of war. And the treaty that was signed, Treaty of Zohar or Kastri Shireen, one of the versions of the treaty is called Sednarname, like the frontier document, showing you that that is the essence of the fight. And it emphasized that the treaty's purpose was to delimit frontiers and boundaries. Ta'ayini, ahbali, sinir, ve hudud. Now, the 1639 treaty did not establish a precise line in some parts it did, but in other parts it says, for example, Basra belongs to the Arabs. We do not know exactly where Basra starts or where Basra ends. In some parts it refers to tribes, the Jaff tribe of the Kurdish tribe. One part of it will be Ottoman, the other part will be Iran. Right? So what this tells us that the local sensibilities were also very important. Like when it comes to the end of the frontier, one thing that people, you know, despite anti-Arab nationalism in Iran, Iran actually got its most important, I will say the most important part of its land, Abadan, thanks to an Arab tribe 
because it was Shia deciding to side with Iran. So local sensibilities play a very significant role in this. And the agency of local people is very important in deciding the borders. Now, what is really interesting, again, about the Treaty of Kastushrin, when you turn your gaze to Europe, you have another treaty, 10 years later, very similar. Right? We have the Treaty of Westphalia, very much like Ottomans and Iranians, who signed a treaty 16, after 16 years of war. You have the Europeans now signing another treaty, Treaty of Westphalia, which becomes kind of the source of the state system that we are talking about today. Again, you see the transformation of territoriality is a global phenomenon which Ottomans and Iranians are taking part in. Right? It's not very different. Now, the Treaty of Zohab did not lay down a precise boundary, but it brought a relatively long peace to the Ottoman Iranian relations. Now, historians will tell you this is not because they didn't want to expand their borders, but because both parties were actually very busy internally. Now, how do we know this? Because the moment of Safavid destruction, when it came, Ottomans immediately jumped on the opportunity. They issued the same fatwas, and Ahmed the Turk sent orders to his commanders, repeating exactly what uh, Mufti Sarugores, Hamza Sarugores, in 1512, or Kemal Pasha Zed, or Abu Suud, all those Sheikh Islam said, and then he actually cites a whole collection of fatwas that we do not know about, that all of them declare Iranians to be kafir, mulhi, rapid, and this and that, killing them, taking their goods and children and wives is permissible. Right? This is 1722. Now, those are, of course, uh, in, uh, you know, today we call them takfiri fatwas, and they all were takfiri fatwas. And again, when you look from the question I started with, Iran's place in the idea of the Adamus, when opportunity arises, shifts. Iran goes very easily from Darul Islam to Darul Harb and Darul Shia, which is worse than Darul Harb. Right? Now, this ambiguity did not last long. Nadir Shah came to power, defeated the Ottomans. Yes, sir? All right. We just at Nadir Shah. We have to come to Nasr al-Din still. So Nadir Shah forces the Ottomans to sign a treaty, and this is a very new development. Now, Charles Mayer, a historian, described the alliance that I'm talking about as the transformation of territoriality, in which a bounded territory and the control of populations within it increasingly became the premise of state sovereignty. In the Ottoman Iranian borderland, as in Europe, this evolving premise of social organization emerged around the mid 17th century. 1639-1648, experienced decisive modifications in the 18th century, Treaty of Cordon in 1746, and culminated in the 19th century when states successfully intensified efforts to territorialize, integrate, and reclaim space with the help of new technologies. The resulting contest between states for control over finite space and its inhabitants is the process of transformation of borderlands into boundaries. Now let me summarize what I'm going to say. So what happened? The borders did not settle, and the parties looked for opportunities. And when opportunity arose, two of the Iranian princes, Abbas Mirza and Dawlat Shah, both of them the governors of large uh, frontier provinces, also rivals for the possible throne. When Ottomans were fighting with the Greeks, they immediately took the opportunity and tried to expand Iran's frontiers, which I call the pendulum, westward. And they did, actually. Some of the disputed lands ever since been in Iranian hands. Now, one new development stopped the Iranians. That was cholera. Cholera emerged in Iranian ranks, killed Dawlat Shah, and ended the Iranian campaign. So, um, so this is a new actor, new global force, and it's indifferent to sectarian or national identities, 
and oblivious to geopolitical boundaries. This infectious and lethal bacterial disease heralded the advent of a novel frontier, the medical one. Now, all right, I want to bring another five more. I got that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, what emerges with cholera? A new type of frontier, a medical frontier emerges. And what this medical frontier, part of the international order, two things. One, cholera, one is the dead bodies. Now, unlike anywhere else, I think the only other place that resembles this is, of course, Iraq. Sorry, Jerusalem, where the Jewish uh, dead are buried at the, at the Mount of Olives. So Iranian, Indian, Afghan, and Iraqi Shiites wanted to be buried in the uh, holy Shia uh, cities of, uh, of Iraq, right? Like cemeteries like this one. Because they want to be resurrected before everybody else because the Imam is there, right? The Imam is going to help them. Now one of the issues is the, uh, the corpse traffic. And what is really interesting, I want to show you some numbers, if I can. Or, sorry. One more. Now, this is the number, if you can uh, look at it, the number of cadavers coming and the number of pilgrims. Now, they are very different, but when you look at the money that the Ottomans were making from the 30,000 pilgrims and 5,000 cadavers, these old people, it was a very profitable <laughs> trade for the Ottomans, those dead bodies. But the problem is they're very existence. And this is the time that cholera is emerging all over the world. And by 1850, we have the beginnings of the World Health Organization, sanitary conferences. The first one in 1851 convenes in uh, Paris. The second one in will be, the third one actually will be convened in Istanbul. And the question is what to do? Are dead bodies carriers of disease? So the Ottoman Empire, that was declared as the sick man of Europe, now had to take measures so that Europe will not get sick. And pressure was put on Egypt, Iran, and Ottomans to actually control their borders. And the dead bodies became a conduit of majority, right? Forcing the Ottomans and Iranians to obey by the new health regime that is emerging in the world. So before having a boundary, Ottomans start establishing a cordon sanitaire, and telegraph was mentioned a lot today. Telegraph stations will also become uh, quarantine stations where Iranians will have to wait. Now, what happens? The Ottomans will now require identity cards from the Iranians, dead or alive. In 1871, Mithat Pasha, the foremost reformer in the Ottoman Empire, and Sepes Salah from Iran, they come together, they say, okay. The Iran Iranians could be buried in Iraq. But before you come to be buried, you have to be buried for three years. Your bones have to be dried and then be brought to Iraq. And there's this very famous kind of anecdote I use in one of my articles. This gentleman brings, he's a very poor gentleman, brings his father's bones in a bag of barley pretending to feed his animal. And Adam is caught it because it's a very profitable uh, trade. So, so what, 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 what this did, the dead bodies forced the Ottomans and Iranians to come with regulations to limit the crossing of the living bodies. And the medical regime that appeared all over the world forced them to come together. So what they did, and what the British and Russians actually forced them to do, because they were going to have another war in 1841. Britain and Russia came in and they said, enough. We have to decide where your borders are. A frontier commission or congress was convened in the city of Erzurum in modern-day Turkey. It lasted for three years. <clears throat> After that frontier commission or congress, then there was a survey commission that worked for another three years. That's six years of work trying to figure out where the boundary is. They collected information. And, sorry. <laughs> Let me see if I go 
they said, okay, we'll have to make a map of this boundary. And I'm very uh, uh, bad at summarizing this whole process that I wrote a book about. They said, okay, we will finish the map of the border in six months. That was, of course, Crimean War and other things. It took them 12 years to make the map of the border. And this is what they come up with. They could not find where exactly the border that was supposed to exist for 350 years is. And if you look at here, so this is, the Ottomans say that the border is here. The Iranians say the border is here. The Mediating Commission says, no, the border is here. And this, of course, did not end the debate. Iranians and Ottomans are not accepting each other's arguments. And, um, and they signed a treaty in 1847. But before that, what happened with the court traffic and Abbas Mirza and Dawlat Shah, they signed another treaty called the First Azul Treaty, 1823. This is the first ever time that religion was not mentioned in Ottoman-Iran relations. When they signed the treaty, the Ottoman delegates, they went back, they looked at the treaty, they said, we did not mention Shia and Sunni Islam. How is this going to happen? Because it's an ideological framework. And then, after much discussion, they said, you know what, it's okay. So that's what I'm calling, talk, talking about secularization. So when Ataturk and Reza Shah came together, and we are, are hailed as the two secular kind of leaders, this is the legacy they are building on. This is the legacy that brought them together. It's a long uh, period of transformation of the borders and secularization of international relations. But this not, it did not end there. When they were going to go to another war, before the First World War, the British and Russian came in, and I'm about to finish. Good timing. Britain and Russia came in again, and they told them that now you have to have a border. Ottomans and Iranians agreed, but with one condition. Britain and Russia said, we've been mediating powers to try to limit this border. It did not work. Because Ottomans are, as you can see in this map, claiming parts of Iran. Iranians are claiming parts of the Ottoman Empire. They said, since for, for, for 70 years almost, we have been mediators, and this mediation did not work. We are going to be arbitrators. And they actually arbitrated the boundary between Iran and the Ottoman Empire. And a couple of days before the end of, sorry, the beginning of the First World War, in around Kotur, the Russian, uh, British, Iranian, and Ottoman delegates finally finalized the border, but that was not the end of it. As we know, Turkey and Iran will exchange lands, and then we know what Saddam Hussein will do, and all. Uh, and all. So, so a border that was supposed to be there for 400 years was not really there. It was somewhere. But it took a very long process of treaties and fights and international intervention to make it happen. And uh, the dead bodies played a very significant role in bringing... Oops, bringing this to a reality. And I think I will cut that.